Hello, Closure Conj. My name is Gadi Shaban. Um, I'm going to be talking today about Java. And this talk is called Java Made Somewhat Simple. It is sort of the opposite of a talk that Rich gave a few years ago at uh, Java Conference, where he made a talk called Closure Made Simple for Java programmers. This is the opposite. This is going to be aspects of the JVM that might be uh, of relevance to you as a Closure developer. And it's geared a little bit towards um, uh, sort of an overview. It's going to anchor you to a lot of the developments on the JVM side. It is not going to be exhaustive, but it's going to allow you to, uh, to find more information where necessary. So this is, this is an orientation. Uh, who I am, I'm, uh, I am a developer at HealthFinch. We are a, a clinical decision support software. We make uh, software that uh, decides whether to refill prescriptions or not to refill prescriptions based on uh, patient charts. Uh, we use Clojure full stack in AWS. Um, I'm very much interested in both Clojure and AWS, and I have other interests like compilers. I've given a couple talks on JVM internals um, at other Clojure conferences. Um, I'm, I've worked for a, a blockchain and cryptography startup in the last few years, and. Uh, I'm super into that now, and um, even though that, that space is pretty crazy, um, but uh, kind of got interest all over that, uh, the, the cloud, AWS, and uh, cryptography uh, areas. So um, the motivations for this talk is that uh, Java is still a great bet. It was a great bet when Rich um, put Clojure on top of Java. It's still a great bet. I'm betting on Java. I'm assuming a lot of you are betting on Java. Um, it's been the winning bet for a long time. Um, so this talk is going to focus on Java 8 and Java 11, which are designated the, the long-term support releases. Um, Java being a, a great bet. This is some clickbait from uh, 1998. Um, and you know, in, in all honesty, uh, What's brought up in this quote, the uh, the uh, the idea of the Java the VM being heavyweight and a deployment um, a challenge for a deployment, it's you know there is some truth to it, but it's not a passing fad by any by any stretch. And in recent Java releases, uh, the stewards of Java have made a lot of efforts to reduce um, to reduce the problems to mitigate the problems uh, that uh, that. Java has with, with deployment. So they've you know, made the JVM smaller, cut it up into pieces, and there's still a lot more work to be done. So it's a great bet. It's going to remain a great bet. And uh, I am not going to be here to uh, apologize for any of the mistakes. I'm not going to apologize for Java serialization. I'm not going to apologize for any of the other warts. Um, and this is not going to be an exhaustive uh, presentation on Java. There are plenty of really interesting talks. I recommend uh, watching things from Brian Getz, from Mark Reinhold, from uh, John Rose. Super fascinating stuff. Uh, the stewards of Java are thinking in decades. They are not going by whatever the last comment is on Hacker News. So um, you, can, you can at least trust that. I think I'm having a little bit of an issue with my slide. It's not advancing. I'm playing on hard mode today. I'm on a Linux laptop with Google Slides <laughs> on USB-C, and it's kind of a miracle that this has worked so far, but this is only slide three, so. There we go. Did that advance? Yes. Woo! I actually can't see that, so this is super hard. <laughs> um, so this is not going to be comprehensive. So let's let's uh, let's get oriented with what's going on in the recent Java developments. This is going to be a quick overview of the last few releases. Java 8 um, was a major release where they introduced lambdas and streams. They kind of go hand in hand. Lambdas were required to make streams palatable. Um, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of VM work done in Java 8 um, to to enable this. 
There, um, this happened in 2014. Um, most closure users, according to the last survey, were on this release. This was a monolithic release, and it had monolithic uh, huge point releases too. 8U20, 8U40, all of these version numbers that uh, they had, those were pretty huge releases. Um, so Java 9 was in uh, late 2017. They added a module system. They basically took um, a hacksaw to the JVM and started splitting it up into uh, containers and putting little bounds around each set of, uh, set of libraries. Uh, it unfortunately broke a few things, and some of the uptake of the module system hasn't been, um, it hasn't had a lot of uptake. It even hasn't had a lot of uptake in the Java community. Um, we'll briefly touch on the module system later, but I recommend listening to a talk by Toby Crawley at uh, ClojureConj a couple years ago. Another um, big thing is they made uh, G1GC the default uh, garbage collector. And uh, we'll look into the garbage collectors later, but this was the last Big Bang release that they did. So uh, we're talking years of development. This was three years between Java 8 and Java 9. Java 10, which was in March of this year, if you can imagine that, it was the first of the accelerated release cadences. They're now shipping every six months. So um, they, the stewards come, uh, they say that the Java 9 module system was the last huge development, and um, there will not be such huge developments after this. They'll sort of be incremental. Um, I still think there, there are going to be interesting things coming out, like value types, which are um, uh, perennially a few years away, but um, those are coming for sure. Um, there were a few language level, level enhancements. Um, the garbage collector got better. Um, they removed the CA cert stack in Java 9, which broke um, a few distributions, and they re-added it in 10, but it's the Oracle set of certificates, which um, is not 100% the same thing as what you would find in your browsers. The big thing that I really appreciated in Java 10 was uh, now the the VM respects the container limits that are set by Docker. So if you're using Kubernetes or Docker, um, anything that manages resource limits through C groups, now Java 10 respects that. So you don't have to actually set your, the XMX option to, to match what the C group is set to or just under because you're kind of paranoid about what happens when the, the heap fills up. Now it's, um, you probably don't even need to set the max heap limit in, um, in Java 10. Uh, that doesn't, that's not true if you use off heap things like uh, direct buffers, but it's a detail. Um, Java 11, which was a couple months ago, um, is the latest long-term support release. It has a new HTTP client that includes HTTP2. It has a couple new garbage collectors, um, a VM level feature called constant dynamic, which is, um, sort of the extension of an older VM feature called Invoke Dynamic um, that actually might have some relevance to, to closure compilation, but that's, a, that's another talk in itself. Um, they've been open sourcing various bits that were sort of mired in the Oracle JDK, so this lightweight flight recorder is now um, available. It's in Java 11. You can enable it without having to, you know, put the, I'm, you know, whatever the commercial options um, command line flag is. Um, and finally, TLS 1.3. It's the first platform to actually have TLS 1.3 baked in. It beat out all other platforms. TLS is exciting because, uh, you know, it reduced one round trip. It's much better security. It's much more forward compatible. Um, so that's really cool that Java um, does that. But I. I like I said, I don't want to apologize for things. I don't want to come across as saying, oh, that's cool that Java got TLS 1.3 before anybody, but it really is, and that, <laughs> so. Okay, you're probably wondering um, if you ever read things online and hear people slam Oracle or question Oracle's motivations, you're probably wondering what is going on with the, the JDK situation is, uh, is Oracle being a bad citizen? Are they plotting something? Are they trying to get some money out of you? Um, 
probably no on the first two points. They probably are trying to get some money. Um, <laughs> but um, there has been a shift in strategy from Oracle about how they're going to support releases. They're, right now, it's, releases come out every six months. And six months and a day in, the last release is unsupported. You're not going to get security patches. You're not going to get any of that stuff. So I consider the JVM to be core infrastructure in the same way that OpenSSL is core infrastructure. Everybody touches it in some way. And it's really important to have stewardship of this platform uh, going forward. So what is going on? Well, there's, there's a. There's a host of people who have stepped up to support the JVM uh, and the OpenJDK releases. There's uh, Adopt OpenJDK, there's uh, IBM OpenJ9, Amazon just released a distribution that is sort of the public packaging of stuff that they already have internally. Oracle actually has builds of OpenJDK and it's super confusing. Um, and I put, on this slide I put Java is still free in quotes not because I'm trying to be snarky or to make you think that it's not, um, but there's an actual article called Java is Still Free, and it explains this in great, great detail, but it just highlights the fact that this stuff is complicated and it needs an ar a whole article to explain um, what is really going on. And in that article, there's a shorter version section and a longer version section, so it's not, it's, it's, it's not easy stuff. So um, I personally, I use the Oracle builds of OpenJDK on 10 at work right now. Haven't quite switched over to 11 yet, but um, I run 11 on my personal development um, machines. But you know, there's, there's a bunch of different places where you can now get security backports and real, um, there's real engineering teeth behind this. So uh, I think I left off Red Hat. Red Hat's also in this space too. Okay, so I'm gonna jump a little bit to one of the libraries that was introduced in Java 8, which is the Java Time Library. This is there because the Java Util Date uh, class was terrible in like N dimensions. It was mutable, it just had bizarre semantics. Um, so Java Time grew out of an effort to improve the situation for the JVM. It's included in Java 8. It is a core library, you can use it. One of the interim stepping stones uh, to, uh, to Java Time was a, a community library called Yoda Time or Yoda Time. And the author of Yoda Time is essentially the author of the Java Time spec that's in the JDK. So he used all of the lessons that he learned using uh, writing J Yoda Time and uh, supporting it over the years to feed into all the design decisions that are in Java Time. So um, I'm going to jump into Java time a little bit just to show you a flavor of the design decisions and how you can uh, understand what's going on on the JVM um, using this package as uh, a motivating example. So there's a few different uh, classes of classes on uh, Java time. You have dates that don't include time. So that's local date. That's year, month, day. And then you have the various subsets of that. You have year month, like 2018 uh, October, month day, and you have years. You have the opposite. You have times without dates. You have local times that are um, uh, useful for, let's say, uh, setting an alarm. That doesn't need a, a date. It just needs a time. You have combinations of dates, times, and zones. So um, Local date time is, uh, just takes a date and a time, so that would be a, a, an event that would happen here. Um, you have instance, which is machine time. That is a point on a continuum. Then you have a couple of uh, date classes that include uh, zones. So you have zone date time and offset date time. And the, the difference between these two is that the zone date time respects uh, daylight saving times rules and other time zone rules. And the offset date time is, is like, uh, you know, minus five is where our, is our offset right here. Okay, um, I love tables. Uh, and if you love tables too, you should go see uh, Daniel Gregoire's talk on tables. Um, I don't know what it's going to be about, but I love tables. So um, here is a table that describes all of this. Uh, you have 
you know, your various combinations of, of uh, dates at the top left. Um, you can have a complete date, which they call local date. You can have a complete time called local time. You can combine the two and anchor it at Greenwich Mean Time. That's an instant. Then you have um, your offset times, zone date time and, off and offset date time, which uh, the first of which includes zone rules. The second one does not. And uh, this is sort of how it's put together. We're going to come back to Java time uh, in a little bit, but um, stay tuned. First, an interlude into calling methods on the JVM. The Clojure website has a great um, tutorial on, uh, well, it's not a tutorial, it's the reference guide to making uh, Java calls from Clojure across the fence to Java. Um, so you can go there and get a lot of detail, but pretty much you have instance methods, you call with a dot syntax, you have uh, static methods that you call um, using uh, the slash with the, with the, the namespace. You can uh, access fields. I'm, I'm here. I'm showing the dot dash notation that is in um, is in more recent closures. Uh, this is to bring parity with closure script uh, field access there. And then you have uh, static uh, static ordinary static fields. Something that's not in the the reference guide that um, probably should be uh, pull requests are accepted there is var args. How do you call var args? This is something that trips up a lot of people. And uh, we're gonna just walk through an example of uh, calling var args. If you go to any Java docs site, you can drill down to the class and then you can drill down into methods or you can use whatever um, integration you have with your IDE. But essentially, you're gonna, at the end of the day, you're gonna be looking at a, a signature. And the signature here is on the, the file, um, it's on the class files, okay? and. This indicates that it's a public method. It's static, so it belongs to the class. It returns a path. The name of the method is copy, and it takes three arguments, two paths, source and a target, and then um, an, a bunch of copy options. So de depending on uh, the semantics of the copy, do you want, do you want an atomic copy? Do you want, uh, I forget all the, all the various incarnations, but the ellipses in Java means it's a var args call. So var args, actually disappear under the hood. What one facility that the, the Java C compiler gives you is that whenever it sees var args, it, under the hood, it will create an array. And the caller is going to roll up all the arguments that were provided into the array. And the, uh, the callee, in this case copy, acts as if that an array was passed in. And actually under the hood, an array was passed in. But the syntax is different. But uh, Java C handles this uh, this sugar. So, given that you know you need to pass in an array on the closure side, you can do it in one of two ways. You can make an array if you don't care about how many options are provided. Just make an array and pass it right in. Um, make an array of length zero. Otherwise, you can um, call into array and just um, roll all the arguments in, into the array. The caveat here is that uh, whatever you roll in that, in that vector has to be castable. It has to be some sort of subclass of copy option for, uh, for it to work under the hood. Erasure is another thing that the, uh, the Java C compiler hides from users. So here's a signature for the interface comparator. And comparators of type T this is a generic, um, have a single method, compare, which takes two t's, which they call O1 and O2, and it returns an int. So we're gonna look at um, what, what comparators are an instance of later, but there's this whole notion now with uh, Java 8 lambdas of functional interfaces. But essentially, uh, under the hood, the t variables disappear, and everything in the bracket uh, in the angle brackets disappear. So while I think you should endeavor to understand all the variants of the things that you can see in the angle brackets, from your perspective as a closure user, you can ignore them. You just have to match all the, um, the various things together. So in this case, to make a comparator, you're gonna reify the comparator interface, and you're gonna provide it the one uh, method signature it needs, which is compare. 
and it takes a O1 and an O2, and you have to add the implicit this argument, which means like the, the object itself, and there I'm ignoring it with the, with the underscore, and then you just fill it in. So those, so var args and generics are, are things that you're gonna see in the Java docs that you might not have a, a perspective of from Clojure because we don't have some of those concepts, but um, this is how you read them and make, make use of them. So back to Java time. Java time, here's another table. Um, Java time is organized really, really, really well. And if you look at the uh, Java, there's a tutorial for, um, for Java time that's uh, written by um, the, 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 the upstream maintainers of, of the JDK. You can see that a lot of the methods are organized in very particular ways. So if you want to construct any one of the classes that we've seen before, you're gonna have a method that starts with of. So a local date takes year, month, day, and you can call local date of to construct one. If you want to convert something, so if, you want, if I wanted to convert a local date to a year month, so something that has year month day to something that just only has year month, uh, you're gonna be calling one of the from methods. And the documentation is very clear that from methods might be lossy, so you might lose precision. In this case, we're losing the day. This is a semantic that you can't express in the type system, but you can express um, in documentation. Um, you can imagine um, other ways of expressing certain constraints like that. If I wanna read something, I'm gonna call one of the parse methods. If I want to associate various bits and pieces of a year month with new bits and pieces, you can call with. So there's a with year, there's also with days on other, other classes, but all of those associ like methods are gonna start with with. I thought associ would, would have been a great name too, but it's not popular on the, on the Java side. If I wanna shift things over, a lot of the classes have plus and minus um, methods, and if I want to combine things together that are heterogeneous, like if I wanted to take a date and anchor it at the start of the day to add time to it, I can use one of the at methods. And so all of these methods, um, they're not called at literally, they can be called at with a, with a suffix on it. So this one's at start of day. Um, I personally like Java time a lot. I think it's really well designed. There's a, there hasn't been a closure library that wraps Java time that I'm super satisfied with, and a lot of closure wrappers um, I call them like white gloves uh, libraries because it's like, I don't want to touch the Java interop, it's nasty, uh, ugh, let me just make some closure API on it. But sometimes the closure libraries get certain elements wrong, like they might um, hide the detail that's available in the library, they might distort some of the design elements, or they might do something um, kind of pernicious like giving new names to concepts that are already very, very clearly named in the, in the underlying library. So just be careful with those. But um, even more than be careful, interrupt's really not that bad, okay? It's, it's quite, quite nice, and once you find something that you do wanna wrap, maybe consider lifting it into your own library. But personally, I don't, I don't use some of the, the wrapper libraries. Okay, some more stuff to read more signatures to read from, uh, from recent JVMs. So here we're gonna introduce um, a lambda. And the lambda is kind of hidden, it's on the third line. It's that rect arrow, rect dot is square. And lambdas are an instance of what the Java documentation calls a functional interface. So you can think of this as a protocol, but it only has a single method and a single arity on that method. So uh, the comparator that we saw before, it has a single method, compare, with no overloading of any sort. That's a functional interface. So comparators preceded um, Java lambdas, which landed in eight, but it's, they were able to retrofit a lot of the nice sugar that you got from uh, lambdas onto ex previously existing uh, classes um, through careful design. So here, um, the signature that we're trying to match here is filter. It belongs on a class called stream. Filter returns a stream of t's, and it takes a predicate that works on t's, okay? 
And so the predicate that is applied later uh, on the third line is the is square method. And so that works on a rectangle and it says, is this thing, um, is this thing square, up or down? Um, and it returns true or false. And it works just like closures filter. And we're gonna collect that into a list at the end. So this is like, um, this is Java's version of uh, into with a collection and then a filter, or either transducer or seek or whatever. So the way you would um, the way you would do this in Closure, if I needed to match this interface, is I would reify the predicate um, the predicate interface. That predicate only has one method on there. It's called test, and it takes an object. And so in, on the Closure side, you're going to have a, a, a you're going to reify that class, and it's going to take an object, and it's going to take the this argument, you know, which you're probably going to ignore because you don't actually really need to access anything on the predicate itself, and you would pass it in. But seriously, uh, the closure, you know, closure's way of dealing with collections is um, a lot better. But you know, if you're on the Java side and you're um, you're using streams, uh, it's okay. It's not like, it, you know, we've we've tasted something nicer. So it's not going to be super awesome if you had to if you have to deal with it. So functional interfaces, these things that have one uh, single signature are called SAMs, single abstract method. You can actually do them on interfaces or you can do them on abstract classes. Anything where you can, uh, you can fill the code in on a single signature, that uh, categorizes as a SAM. So the common SAMs all live in the Java util function, inter, uh, function package. There's consumer, there's supplier. Consumer is like uh, something that takes something and returns nothing, it just eats it. Supplier is something like um, closures uh, delay. It's something that provides something, or, it, or it's a func. Um, predicates are checks. Functions um, transform things. And then there's by predicate, by function, by consumer, which is just the two arity version of all of these things. You have to have another type to do that. Um, and closure, you know the deal, OK? That's, here's the controversy slide. You can tweak that one. Um, all right, I'm going to move on quickly. Class loaders, ooh. Um, I'm going to give you a kitten because class loaders are scary and I'm going to soften the blow a little bit. So just like um, babies are delivered by storks, uh, classes are delivered by class loaders. So <laughs> in the modern Java platform, I'm talking post module. So anything after nine, this is what the stack of class loaders looks like. You're going to have the closure dynamic class loader, and then the JVM itself is going to provide three different class loaders who, that have different responsibilities. The contract of a class loader is if I need to get a class, I'm going to ask class loader for the class. The class loader is going to de delegate to its parent. So if the application loader um, needs to get a class, it's going to first ask the platform loader, hey, do you have this class already ready? OK. Nope. I'll load it myself. Um, and then closure hooks in on the bottom. Depending on whether you're using line or boot or some sort of application container or um, some curated uh, environment, like uh, some AWS stacks have um, custom class loaders, the chain might be a little different, but they're gonna share the top three uh, in common. Okay, I'm gonna jump over to the REPL a little bit. And I'm on Linux, like I said, so I'm going to abort this if it turns out to be a terrible idea. Oh, I can already tell this is a bad idea because I won't be able to <laughs> see. <laughs> okay. Um, Yeah, it's coming, but I won't be able to see it. <laughs> okay, that's not so terrible. I'm going to have you compile this in your heads. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do here, um, oof, I really cannot see that. We're going to instantiate a class. We're going to create a class, okay? 
and it's the record, my info. It takes three arguments. We're going to create a my record. Oh, sorry, is it my info? Oof. Um, so we're going to create one of those. We're going to def it. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to reload that definition. So Clojure is going to reload this class. It's going to put it, um, we're going to get another instance out of that class. We're going to def that elsewhere. Has anybody ever run into the issue where you, where you call something and it says, hey, I can't cast your class foo to foo? You ever seen that? Everybody. OK, so the reason that happens is because those two classes, while they have the same literal name, they come from different class loaders. And so the JVM considers those to be not equivalent. So the classes are not, not going to be equal. And so no instances of the classes are going to be equal. Generally, instances of different classes are not equal uh, in the JVM unless you override it. Can, does anybody know of a case in Clojure where it's overridden, where that behavior gets changed? Col collections, vectors and lists have, have, that, uh, have that sort of cross, cross uh, equality. OK. Um, so you can take my word for it that that example is going to show you surprising results about uh, the equality. It's going to show false. OK, um, pray to your deity of choice while I remove this window. Actually, I'm going to peek wrap and kill it. Gone? Yeah. Cool. I can kill things. All right. Um, just a little more detail on how classes come to be. When a class is requested from the class loader, there's three phases. It's going to get loaded, it's going to get linked, and then it's going to get initialized. First of all, the loading uh, is, is just pulling it off disk. Linking is a little bit more complicated. Uh, first of all, since Java made the decision to distribute code in portable bytecode, we have to check that all the semantics are legit on that bytecode. So we're going to verify that you know, the stack lengths are preserved, all kinds of security, uh, security verifications. We're going to prepare the class for loading. We're going to resolve all the other classes that are referred to by that class. And we're going to recursively do this. And then we're going to initialize the class by calling all the static constructors. So anything that needs to happen before any instance of the class is created, those are static methods, those have to all get initialized. So this happens every single time uh, you load anything on the JVM. Um, I'm not going to talk about modules too much, but um, like I said, go see Toby Crawley's talk. It's going to um, orient you around modules for, uh, for a closure audience. There's a lot of other tutorials, but uptake is pretty low. Um, but I will highlight that uh, one of the tools that came out that allows you to distribute JVMs in a smaller, uh, in a smaller package is called uh, JLink. What JLink does is it outputs a full Java distribution. No installer, no nothing like that, but just something that you can tar up and you know, put in a Docker container or ship it somewhere. But um, essentially, you just declare what, you, what modules you want to include in the JVM. Clojure is going to require at least java.base and java.sql. Uh, everybody requires java.base, so you can't get around that. But of course, that's just Clojure. Anything that you pull in, all your dependencies, all your AWS libraries, all that crap is going to pull in a lot more um, modules. If you, want it, if you want to pull in the module that includes all other modules, there's one called java.se. Um, so here with a restricted with a restricted package, you can get the whole JVM down to 59 megs, which can be important mm -hmm. in some environments. If you choose to do uh, java.se, it's going to be like 90 megs. But it's not like the 500 meg or 800 meg containers that you used to see. Um, really quickly, I'm going to show you some packages to know and to go uh, look at, because uh, frankly, they're uh, pretty well designed like Java time. Um, Java Util Concurrent has tons of state-of-the-art concurrent data structures. Um, over the years, Doug Lee has uh, uh, implemented some of the most like, astonishingly um, complex algorithms, and they're available for, for use um, as a library. So that you have thread pools, you have queues, various synchronization utilities, uh, concurrent hash map. Um, that gets used in Clojure. The namespaces are backed by a concurrent hash map. Um, 
We have atomic things that model the atomic su succession model in Clojure, um, references and uh, integers and various um, concurrent adders. And then there's a bunch of related things around futures. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple libraries that I think are important outside of the JVM, but you pretty much want to know how these things work. Um, and my coworker says, I love a good facade. And I thought, I'm going to show you two facades here. The first one is micrometer. And what is this? This is user space uh, monitoring. So you can monitor uh, any sort of application level things like counters, gauges, or histograms, stuff that you'd find in other libraries but um, this provides a unified API. You can pump all of those things to various backends. I, personally, I love Prometheus. That's like my, my library of choice, but uh, my monitoring stack of choice. But if you need to use CloudWatch, you can use the CloudWatch exporter and uh, Micrometer pumps it for you. It looks like this. And uh, anything you do in user space goes through Micrometer and gets sent to the back end, and different back ends have different semantics, like Prometheus is a pull model, uh, StatsD is a push model over UDP, where they expect you to send things at different cadences. And then they have various conveniences to pump out all the stats from your, let's say, your garbage collector, um, from your web library, like Jetty. But I, I really like my micrometer. There's not a great like uh, closure wrapper, as far as I know, but um, um, I might open source something in this space, but SLF4J is the same thing, but it's for logging. Um, micrometer refers to itself as SLF4J, but for metrics. And somebody was like, wait, I hate SLF4J. Like, why would you do that? But it, it really, it's the same concept. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a facade and it allows you to route all of the libraries that you don't like to the library that you do like. And so in this case, they're routing everything to log back. Um, so you know, various other dependencies that you pull in, you might not have the choice of what, what library they use. So everybody um, goes through the facade. OK, so basically, more about operating the JVM. There are various tools for compiling, decompiling, making jars, linking packages, pulling stats out of the JVM, dumping threads. Um, and then uh, pretty much everybody's least favorite one, key tool for um, doing Java key stores and uh, certificates and uh, uh, trust stores. Um, and finally, I want to tell you about uh, the various garbage collectors that are available in JDK 11. Um, I'm going to make the assumption and recommendation that people start moving what uh, what JDK that they test against towards Java 11. Things are going to move a lot faster in the future, but unfortunately, um, you know, AWS Lambdas are still stuck on eight. That will probably change next year. But so these might not all be available, but they're going to be available in the future. So G1GC, the garbage first collector, that's the default now. Um, it's generally good for um, pretty much any heap size. It runs based on uh, throughput, and it controls the latency with, the, with some knobs. Uh, that's going to be standard. They've improved that in, in Java 10 significantly, so it pauses less. The parallel collector is great if you have huge heaps, but you're going to pay for it in, uh, in pause time. The serial collector is useful if you have one CPU, a, a small task. Um, I'm talking like a 100 megabyte kind of task, which Clojure can target. You can totally do that. But um, that's where you would consider using serial. So I think some of the in JVM internal tools like JPS um, and JSTAT and all that stuff use, use the serial collector. Uh, the new one is ZGC. Uh, the Z doesn't stand for anything. It's part of Java 11. And this can target multi-terabyte heaps, which let's be real, most of us don't have. But um, it is on par with all the, the state-of-the-art uh, garbage collectors from Golang. So they've done so much work in Golang to, to make low latency garbage collection. And ZGC is, uh, is the JVM's our chance to shine. So we get this too. Uh, this is still experimental. And the other uh, collector that uh, 
was introduced in Java 11 was the Epsilon collector, which uh, uh, just don't use it because it doesn't garbage collect anything. This is for benchmarking, and it's for like getting the, JV, the garbage collector out of interference uh, with, uh, with, your, with your benchmarking. So um, I'm just going to say don't and no for heap sizes and flags. But um, so that was sort of a whirlwind overview of some of the user level features of the Java platform. It's a vibrant, vibrant platform. It's going to be a vibrant platform in the future. Uh, I can't see the future, but you know, it's been 25 years. It's done well. It's going to continue to do well. Uh, don't listen to Hacker News about all the all the crap that you hear there. Um, I'm betting a career on it, so um, I'm I have skin in the game there, and I hope you now have some uh, some orientation around how to make use of this platform. Thank you very much. <laughs>